the anti-Oedipus, for those of you who don't know, I mean, I'm sort of really hoping that there's people here who are completely new to Deleuze and Guattari, because this is the absolute baptism of fire with regards to both Deleuze and Guattari, continental philosophy and philosophy in general. This is the Bear Grylls expedition of philosophy. Anti-Oedipus especially is an absolute minefield of what the hell is going on the first time you tackle it. So if you're new to Deleuze and Guattari and you, you've, you've found the reading group and you've started delving into the text and you're thinking, seriously, what is this? Don't worry, it all comes together and it's one of the most exciting texts ever written, quite literally. Um, unfortunately, with the editions, um, when, I, when I said about 20 pages a week, there is multiple editions and the edition that I have, which is this sort of kitsch Bloomsbury edition, has a page spacing so actually on the Bloomsbury edition we're going up to page 34 um, but on the edition that was linked in the chat we are still going up to page 20 which was just before a materialist um, psychiatry. Now there is um, two things I want to mention before we um, delve deep right so in the Bloomsbury edition and I think this is found elsewhere and I think it might have been linked there's this preface by Michel Foucault Michel Foucault, as many of you will know, is a philosopher of power and language and was a friend of Deleuze and was in the scene in the 70s when this was being written. And Foucault's preface is something that, anti uh, that, that many studies of anti-Oedipus now don't seem to focus on, which is the notion and the question of fascism in anti-Oedipus. Most people now, when they're directing they think about Oedipus, think about it in a Kantian way, they think about it in a way of production instead of communication, or they think about it in terms of desire or psychoanalysis. And the question of fascism is actually one that runs throughout Deleuze and Guattari and Deleuze at certain points, and specifically Foucault as well. And Foucault does state that it's a book of ethics. And what we're really looking at when Foucault is stating that we're dealing with fascism is that the whole idea of the whole the, the whole name the name anti Oedipus. Many of you will know that, that this term Oedipus comes from the Oedipus Rex plays, and this idea of a sort of inherent familial attachment to restrictive and constraining structures of being. Um, so you have the Oedipal triangle, which is the, the you know the mother father child triad, which is used by psychoanalysis. Now. Deleuze and Guattari do sort of latch onto this and they they um, they deconstruct it and they play around with it. But I think for the when for your first reading of Antiedipus, um, the um, really you should think of Oedipus, just the word Oedipus, as an abstraction for the ways in which we are controlled and sort of assimilated and subsumed into something which is causing us to have a desire which is actually castrating or suffocating ourselves and Foucault puts this question which is from Wilhelm Reich which is how could the masses be made to desire their own repression so one tangent which is being tackled by Deleuze and Guattari in this book is this question where um, where are these coming from where are these institutions coming from why are we so compelled to constrain ourselves in this way and what is sort of the structure which is allowing this to happen the second strain of thought which is the one that i've always sort of come to this book and been interested in is the one with regards to desire and production so in antidepus man is sort of completely altered into what deleuze and Qatari would call a desiring machine and they are sort of immanentized this is a philosophy of imminence and not transcendence there isn't these ideas of above and below and getting out because everything is imminent and horizontal to each other. The, the only levels that we could find would be from the subject itself. So if something is created from the subject, some form of containment or lock-in, that is from the subject's perspective and not part of the whole system itself. And desiring production is, you know, this is what's, being primarily spoke uh, written about in these early sections, especially in chapter one, the desiring machines, and this is just a quick idea that production is sort of Deleuze and Guattari's primary focus in these early sections, and the idea that everything 
can be subsumed into this loop of production and consumption. So I've given the the example of a cow, like a cow consumes grass, it produces shit. The the shit would produce nutrients into the into the further grass and the whole loop can, goes on and on and on. And I would make it clear that these productions and consumptions, even so they seem completely abstract, are entirely real. Um, for Deleuze and Qatari, the, the, there is a, an idea of a virtual and actual, which unfortunately isn't articulated with Deleuze and Qatari. You just have to piece it together as you go. We may well, we might articulate that as it comes up. But for now, these are the two strands I sort of want to put in and say that these are the two things, two huge overarching paths which one can um, attend to when they, they read Antidipus. If anyone has anything they want to contribute or or, or or something that has, you know, um, befuddled them with the text or confused them, then, you know, feel free to jump in and uh, f feel free to jump into the conversation. So I'm, I might as well, uh, I might as well start. Uh, uh, thanks, Meta, for organizing this, first of all. Uh, good job. <laughs> I, I've been waiting for a good Deleuze reading group for quite a while. And what you mentioned about Anti-Oedipus being a book of ethics, I, I think uh, uh, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, yeah, it is a book uh, towards human flourishing in the, in the romantic sense. Uh, this, is, this is what uh, he inherits from Nietzsche. And this is what I love about Deleuze and Guattari the most. They, they have a keen interest in the human and and how the human you know can express itself to the fullest uh this uh this uh this is this is sadly very much lost in very many people who uh adapt to lose it's it's been lost in pretty much every m major you know reworking of the lose into something else that i i have read and uh uh even even i think uh, Meta's own accelerationist work uh, kind of uh, goes more towards uh, the metaphysical side. So, uh, <laughs> uh, what 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 my interest is here is is, uh, is to keep keep reminding everyone that Nietzsche Nietzsche was a romantic philosopher and will always be a romantic philosopher, no matter uh, how much you guys want him not to be. <laughs> Uh, someone, I just want to jump in and say, um, someone in the chat has asked for Antidipus, does it help to have read Deleuze's previous work? Um, when a lot of people are talking about Deleuze, they often actually mean Deleuze and Guattari, and they, they often get confused. And there's, even though with certain books by Deleuze and Guattari, it's clear that Deleuze wrote a lot of it, especially with what is philosophy, apparently he wrote pretty much all of it. Um, it would of course help to read their previous work, but I think a, a, a close reading. Here's the thing with Antiedipus. I don't think I've ever found a book which draws on so many influences and experiences and writers and other texts. So to say, what influences should, should I read? Sure, there's a few big ones in there, Freud, Marx, um, Lacan, Lyotard to a certain extent. They're there, but there's so many other ones going through it because of this combination from Deleuze and Guattari that I think you would get lost doing that. So going in blind is, is, is completely fine. Um, yeah. Uh, back to the, the, the Nietzschean thing with regards to, to accelerationism. I mean, the, it's way, way later in the, in the text, but the, the, I think it's like page 300 and something. Um, I can't remember, but it's where the, you know, the, the whole motto accelerate the process comes from, which is initially in this book, but people don't realize that they're actually, Deleuze and Guattari are actually quoting Nietzsche when they, they talk about that. So they're sort of, Nietzsche's original aphorism, which is aphorism 505 from The Will to Power, is um, specifically about l accelerating the leveling of European man. And this sort of deconstructive and destructive process is taken on by Deleuze and Guattari and just understood as the continual process of capitalist fragment 
adaptation with regards to one's identity. So the leveling leveling of European man turns into just the complete um, deterritorialization of what we can consider a coherent identity. And Deleuze and Guattari take that in another direction. And they sort of remove the romantic aspect, which would be the romantic European aspect, and say, what is this leveling? What is it that's leveling man? And it is the anti oedipal forces of capitalism because capitalism is a is inherently not necessarily inherently specifically anti oedipal capitalism will do what is needed for its own um production so it doesn't really matter if it's oedipal or anti oedipal but that in itself is anti oedipal because it it there you have structures which are oedipal and it might use them it might not but the whole overarching structure of not really giving a shit about which structures you use is in itself anti oedipal because you're not adhering to, um, shall we say, like a meta level of structure. Um, I'll try not make this just just me chatting so if anyone else wants to jump in they can but someone has asked should we think of desire as material ontological psychological force or something else um this is sort of an extremely nuanced and um tough question especially with regards to anti oedipus um to a certain extent we could consider it material in the sense that Deleuze is specifically working with an idea of transcendental empiricism, which is Kant's philosophy of the transcendental made imminent. So it's this is this is already where it gets difficult. Um, I think potentially the best way is to quickly articulate what because they're going to come up and they're really key two theorizations of the the actual and the virtual so in terms of how we experience things for for De- this is specifically coming from Deleuze but it features heavily the actual is if you think of um we're all using a computer monitor so if you think of a computer monitor in our material and and phenomenal that is the material world relations with it it's heavy it's clunky it has these very specific aspects of it as a as a as a piece of matter as a piece of material as an object in phenomenal reality however it does have a virtual side and the virtual side is its attributes its habits its its heaviness its let's say brightness these are the attributes which can connect and network and cross reference between things and i think probably maybe the best place to start with regards to desire in terms of the desiring machines is in terms of virtuality and that desires have an adherence to the virtual because if we, when we think about desire in terms of what's going on in our everyday lives, if you think about an advert, an advert isn't the material of your desire. An advert for a car is the virtual aspect of a desire. It's trying to, to promote to you um, an idea or a virtuality of a desire. So it's like, this car is really fast and it gives me, I don't know, higher status in society or it gives me sex appeal or something. But these are referential habits of this desire. Whereas the actual desire, the actual the actualization of that desire would be this car. And when you finally get this car, you would still have this void of desire. And that's because I think for Deleuze and Guattari, desiring, you know, the hyphen of desiring production it's really important. These aren't separate things. And same with desiring machines. These aren't machines that desire. Of course, they are machines that desire and desire is also produced. But these processes are completely interlinked with the the predicate and and the, the, the concept there. So that the whole thing is looped. So they're actually imminent to the idea. So desire is produced as much as one produces desire and it's constant. Um, same with the whole idea of desiring machines is something which is inherently something which is on this plane of desire which i think the easiest way early on to think about it is that you have these virtualities which are sort of i would theorize of them as just just for ease of language to say they're on the outside and they're from somewhere else and they're sort of controlling you and these of course are the virtualities which get stuck in 
institutions and structures and, and ideologies. So uh, I, 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 I take offense that you say that Deleuze removes the romantic aspect. Um, this is this is a bit uh, this it, it is it is in a sense a very bad battleground for me to take because anti Oedipus is the uh, 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 least romantic work uh, between Deleuze and Guattari. But if you think of the sense uh, what this book is trying to accomplish, it is uh, it is uh, about liberation liberation from what? So here. It shares a very similar goal to uh, the romantic ideal of the actualized person who is in this world fully and completely. And uh, to to say that uh, they, they take Nietzsche and they only take this process uh, that levels, 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 it is, I think, a very... Uh, a very bad way. This is this is this is reading. Uh, this is this is uh, mm, how do I put it? You 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 need to forget who Nick Land is. <laughs> Nick Land never existed. There is no Nick Land. Uh, it is, I think, wholly important to still read uh, read this uh, with a keen sense of you know th this is this is still written for humans. Uh, I, I do, I do agree that the end goal is not exactly the same as the romantic end goal because the end goal of anti-Oedipus is that there is no human. The human subject has completely dissolved in some sense into something um, greater uh, in a sense, but we, we are still humans. We are flesh and blood and it is a book written for humans. So I... Yeah, I, I think I think removing removing romanticism from the losing Guattari will will get you to Nick Land, <laughs> which is uh, as a human being I do not want to get there uh, so fast. Maybe want to savor the lose a bit before going to Nick Land and losing all hope. Uh, the second thing is that your car example when uh, maybe maybe we're going a bit too far here, but your car example where you described that buying a car. Uh, is fulfilling the desire of, you know, being desirable, uh, women wanting it, but actually buying the, the car uh, doesn't fulfill a lack. Uh, this is framed in a very Lacanian way. <laughs> and if uh, Deleuze and Guattari say anything about the desire, about desire, it is that it is not a lack, you know. Uh, we, uh, buying this car still fulfills desires, but maybe not the ones that we are led to believe. There is a uh, void, void well, what, what I'm trying to say is that void is definitely not the correct word to use there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so some of the background with this, this text, I mean, you mentioned that uh, that's a Lacanian view of desire. I mean, with, with regards to the background of this text, obviously it's written by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. And Félix Guattari was a student of Lacan who then, Lacan hated this book so much that he banned his students from reading it. And personally, I don't see too much anti-Lacanian thought in it. I don't really think it's an attack on Lacan as much as it's a, an, a, 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 it's a, it's a reaction to um, forms of control. Someone in the chat says it's saving Lacan from Lacan himself. Um, with regards to my uh, idea of desire, I was yeah just trying to get in a, a quick overview of how desire is sort of psychoanalytically understood. Um, in terms of them saying that there isn't a lack, but our desires come from something else this is sort of where for me the loop always came in is that you're always into the next form so it's production and consumption right so when you consume a desire for Deleuze and Qatari you're simultaneously producing the uh, trying to be very careful with the language I use but just to quickly get into it you're similar you would simultaneously producing sort of a proof that you desire that desire so in the same time that you're consuming a desire you are 
creating or producing some form of lust for that desire in, in its okay. uh, constant form of creation. If, if we were to be bad students, you could say that we were building the void as it was getting filled. <laughs> so that there was no void after, after all. Um, yeah, so someone's commented with regards to bringing in, if we're going to approach bringing in other concepts of Deleuze's work, like the actual and the virtual, then Difference and Repetition would be the most important book by Deleuze to check out. Um, it would, I agree. It's a great starting place for Deleuze generally. It's also notoriously difficult. Um, that will probably be the next reading group after this, but this one's going to take long enough. Um, so um, moving into the text again, um, on page 12 of the Bloomsbury edition, not sure which page this is going to be on the other edition. I do apologize. I'm going to have to sort this out. But there's this fantastic quote, and I think it really outlines the position. I mean, I already have some disagreements with um, Forst is the person who's doing a lot of the other chatting in the moment. I have some disagreements with him with regards to the place of the human and the understanding of the human within Antiochus. And I think it's probably primarily one of the focus points of this book is how is the human being controlled? what can be said of the human within being controlled and in what sense do we understand hum the human generally and yeah everyone knows i have a, a an, an almost extreme or, or radical sympathy for the landian reading of this book um trying not to get too complicated you mentioned that if we strip the romanticism from deleuze and guattari then we get land i would argue that if we strip the the bergsonism from Deleuze and Guattari, we get land. That's what Mark Fisher argued, I agree with it. But anyway, the quote, um, Deleuze and Guattari state, there is no such thing as either man or nature now, only a process that produces the one within the other and couples the machines together, producing machines, desiring machines everywhere, schizophrenic machines, all of species life, the self and the non-self, outside and inside, no longer have any meaning whatsoever. And it's interesting in that quote that there's no such thing as either man or nature. Of course, we have this sort of certain understanding of ourselves of what man is. But nature is sort of this this relatively, I guess, touchy subject in philosophy. But luckily for us, on the very next page, they state nature as a process of production. And perhaps it's me getting, once again, quite bleak and, and overlandianizing all of this. But this quote for me is is the very early situating this as a philosophy of imminence this whole idea of the outside and the inside no longer have any meaning whatsoever is that there the if you remove the edipalized structures you don't have these boxed off areas wherein things are on the inside and the outside there the virtualities are free flowing between all of these things and we can't constrain production and communication in that way Does, uh, does anyone have any um, questions of their reading of the text? Any of the newcomers have any? I mean, feel free to ask the dumbest questions. Um, this isn't so much I, a new... Oh, uh, there's the other guy. I can go if I want. No, go ahead. Go ahead. This isn't so much a newcomer question, but I was sort of guilty of the difference of repetition recommendation. I actually found that book easier to figure out. That probably has something to do with my background being stronger in history of philosophy than history of psychoanalysis, say. So that might have been something to do with that. Like, this was the book that really threw me through a loop the first time I read it, which is actually the first thing by Deleuze I ever ran across, which is also probably the problem. But that was quite a long time ago. But So going back through it is interesting. I guess we could sort of shift with sort of focused on like a few like, debates around his interpretation of Nietzsche and whatnot, we could have a look at like, the implication of capitalism and all of this, which actually goes back to the land re the sort of Landian reading brought, that's been brought up versus, which I guess the, sort of the accelerationist reading versus you can sort of take, like a lot of the other commentators on Deleuze have sort of disputed that over the years, like under, under whether it's sort of worth exploring 
that sort of thing where land where land really seems to privilege the sort of anti edip sort of going into later of the book the sort of anti edipus approach to the whole thing as over the sort of what happens later in in like a thousand plateaus where sort of Deleuze seems to want to back away from the more radical kind of accelerationist conclusions oh, that you see in this book. I I I I. Don't... I uh, fuck. <laughs> I don't know. I I would I would say that I strongly disagree. I think that uh, a thousand plateaus goes even deeper, but it goes in very specific ways. You know, it is a much more specific book. Uh, but I I do I don't think that you can remove accelerationism from Deleuze completely. Um, no, like that. In terms of the destroy, 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 that sort of message is you're not as strongly pushed or as strongly but, felt in like a thousand plateaus but, as opposed but to accelerationism I, I i think this is getting way way too off topic uh we can i i can uh, uh who are you exactly um so i can i can dm you i can dm yeah. you later uh but this is this is getting a bit uh bit too far um yeah i'll just put a quick comment in there um Someone's actually asked a very uh, important question, and it articulates a lot of what's going on in anti Oedipus. Um, but quickly on the land thing, there is a land Deleuze and Guattari. There is a there is a land does this very quickly on land. He does this with everything. So um, his Deleuze and Guattari is stripped of um, many influences, and it turns it into this sort of machinic hell. His camp is stripped of certain things. You won't find an ounce of vitalism in him anywhere. So it sort of inherently changes everything. So perhaps after we've done the full reading, we can sort of move in. Or when we get nearer those sections, we can move in. Now, the important question that someone's asked is, this is probably the only philosophy text, well, maybe there's quite a few in continental philosophy, but it might be the only book reading ever where the question, how can an anus shoot sunbeams become an, um, become an important question? Um, and really early on, this is probably what puts a lot of people off the text as a like a ridiculous, perhaps potentially ridiculous thing is um, Deleuze and Guattari basically say that Jub, Judge Schreiber's anus is a solar anus. And um, this is probably one of those early um, meetings with continental philosophy and sort of late continental philosophy in the 70s where, oh, I'm sorry, it's this it's late 70s, where... The, the the language is so dense but actually what they're doing with this is one of the clearest articulations of what the whole book's doing so with regards to the schreiber it's a reading of um daniel paul schreiber who was a german judge and he was a a case study of sigmund freud so classical psychoanalysis of course one of the most famous case studies and he had this sort of onset of psychosis um some um freud put some i believe hypnotized him uh the psychosis sort of progressed he believed that god was turning him into a woman and sending rays down to enact miracles on him now there's a lot of other stuff going on with the case i advise reading it at some point the point is that freud reads schreiber's case as one of repressed homosexuality, right? And it doesn't really, um, of which like all his symptoms are pointing back to this thing. And I don't really particularly think it matters the way in which, or the specific end point in which Freud reads it. For Deleuze and Quattari, their criticism is with Freud reading it via this psychoana uh, psychoanalytical reading. And their sort of project here is that psychoanalysis but if we move that out abstractly we can think about let's say Foucault takes on uh, clinical psychiatry generally or f institutions of power we can understand these as reading a sort of large swathe of, of lived experiences of personal and subjective psyches and they're filtered through these these systems and Deleuze and Guattari what they're saying is it's not just reductionist you aren't you you've taken this one thing that's happening and you've pushed it through this tiny filter of possibility and then you've come to a conclusion there and it's they this is where they sort of advance their own interpretations of what's going on and saying well what if you went into these 
these dreams and this ideas that you're having um what processes come about and what productions come about and what consumptions do there need to be for such a thing as Schraber's Solar Anus to be produced generally um his symptoms Deleuze, to, to Deleuze and Guattari aren't seen in the same vein as a sort of fault of normality as they are in classical psychoanalysis they're seen in the domain of consumption and production and so when Deleuze and Guattari are on about this solar anus they um, they're taking it as what's being produced here generally and understanding that classical psychoanalysis is coming at this at uh, a priori coming at it at a point of no I shouldn't say a priori they are prior coming at it at a point of containment it's already contained within the language that they wish to see it through whereas Deleuze and Guattari are sort of stating especially later on the idea of schizophrenia and the skits they're saying well what if we pushed it you know what what happens when we go into this idea that god was turning him into a woman what happens if we push these limits to see what happens um which does sort of link back to land because land of course didn't take the advice that comes later on in uh, a thousand plateaus which which says always retain some territory you shouldn't always completely take the uh, schizophrenic line of flight and push all limits because you will eventually break some things which can't be unbroken. Um, but that is, of course, a very interesting way to do philosophy too. Um, so that is actually, you know, what what sort of what he means by uh, shooting sunbeams out of his anus, yeah. Uh, you you actually, we have chronologically passed, uh, passed, the, passed the point uh, in, a, in the book that I kind of want to discuss. Uh, very, very early on, they discussed the... Uh, uh, the model of the schizo, which is taking a walk, a schizo taking a walk. I, I myself <laughs> decided to do this, uh, do this reading group while taking a walk. It's been very, very pleasurable. Uh, and I think from there you can you can do a quick hop and a jump into a very interesting and seemingly unrelated uh, book uh, called Tao Te Ching, which is the uh, one of the most important texts in Taoism. And I do think that the Luz and Guattari uh, have some very interesting things uh, you can read into Taoism from the Luz and Guattari and vice versa. Uh, first of all, the, the concept of uh, a walk in their philosophy is uh, very reminiscent of the Taoist wandering, wandering everywhere, which is basically uh, happy-go-lucky would be not quite, but but you know a similar thing, which is you you just walk around, see what comes up, and uh, take it as it is. Which I think, like you said, it is very important in the losing Guattari to not, uh, you know, you to take things as they are, to not try to push them into boxes which into which they do not fit. This is also a very important uh, principle in Taoism, and. Uh, the second one is, of course, the flow, that which is everywhere, desire, which is very similar uh, to the Tao, which is the, their flow, which is everywhere. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I recommend everyone to read Tao Te Ching as a companion piece to Anti-Oedipus. It is not very long, and there are some points where Tao Te Ching completely and absolutely breaks uh, from Anti-Oedipus, but it is a very interesting uh, companion piece. Yeah, I mean, I want to um, ex expand on the notion of the schizophrenic because it's gonna it's gonna come, you know, it's it's obviously gonna appear a lot more um, on page fifteen once again of the Bloomsbury edition. Um, the Lizard Quartari do state schizophrenia is like love. There is no specifically schizophrenic phenomenon or entity. Schizophrenia is the universe of productive and reproductive desiring machines. Universal primary production as the essential reality of man and nature and it and, and for me the my reading of that is that before any forms of what they would understand as striation so we think about um virtualities and flows of existence being taken in by things such as psychoanalysis things such as the nuclear family institutions schools 
flows are taken into these and constrained within a, let's say, an apparatus, a box. And then humans enter into these and the schizophrenia goes because they've got these limits which they're no longer breaking. And the schizophrenic then, and schizophrenia, I think it's best to think of it as schizophrenia because I think it actually can um, leap between the boundaries. I don't think it's just humans who are schizophrenic i think almost like markets could be schizophrenic in certain places and schizophrenia is the limits of pushing the limits of the shall we say presupposed natural setting of production within that setting so you have this this assumed mode of production that say happens within a prison or a school and it's the idea of the schizophrenic or schizophrenia in general in general pushes the limits of this they the Deleuze and Qatari state that pushes the limits of social production what's being produced socially say within an institution can be pushed by the schizophrenic but of course the schizophrenic as this sort of nomadic entity risks being captured when it enters into these so the you know this is why it's forced um the name of the, the person who's chatting here he mentions going for a walk and it's the idea of just being completely free of these and moving between them um which is the idea of a line of flight you're just taking this line as opposed to sort of having any stoppages um and it being the central reality of man and nature i think is extremely important but they have put that in quotation marks i'm not sure where the reference is for that one so I do apologize um and the it being the essential reality of man and nature of course is sort of the the the, the fundamental theme of anti oedipus is well what was the human prior to being captured by oedipus and this is something that Deleuze and Qatari is like this constant pulling back of things which have been applied yeah, I, and I, I think, I think this, this is you, you summarized exactly what I mean by, by the romantic and the losing Gutari, because, you know, this is, this is exactly the type of stuff that Rousseau was talking about. Uh, uh, if, if you, if you understand where I'm coming from with the romantic stuff. Uh, hey, can I just like cut in and ask a pretty basic question? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just did a cursory reading of this. I, I haven't like looked at the text closely, and, um, and I'm not super familiar with the the listening gallery. But um, my question is basically like, what really is the body without organs? Because it feels like you get a bunch of different examples or like metaphors, but it's really unclear what it, <laughs> what it actually is. Like, can we pinpoint? that concept like that would be really helpful yeah i I, uh, I actually can i actually can that's the uh the, the almost the cliche like oh i'm really into Deleuze. explain to me what the body without organs is uh um i probably some Deleuze scholar will come in and me email me at some point saying like your definition of the body without organs is overly simple or or something along these lines but i once you get it, I don't think it's that complicated. And it, it it rests on the concepts that we've already mentioned of the virtual and the actual. So, you know, book is hard, uh, it's heavy, the paper is, let's say, flimsy. These are its actual, com its actual attributes in relation to the way we physically interact with it. Its virtual attributes are the ones which we can cross-reference, which we are habits and customs and etiquettes and... Um, ideas and concepts and flows and fluxes which flow between things now the body without organs there is singular body without organs there is the general body without organs and there is arguably the body without organs of capitalism which does some different things I'm not going to go into that one but there is singular body without organs and there is the general body without organs when we think of the body without organs it can be of any single object or anything and all it is is the collection of that certain things virtualities they're not organs because they haven't been actualized and they haven't become these um should we say striated lumps which have to function in the way they do virtualities remain free-flowing right so the 
it's to think about it metaphorically you can almost think of it as the thing which is behind the curtain of any object it's the attributes which make it up when we look at it as a as a concept and the importance of it is not for me at least is not as it's place as this sort of void which doesn't matter because we don't see it but it's function it's the place of all possibility for something it's it's because these virtualities are free flowing um it's something which can then record things and things can objects and ideas and even say a society would have a body without organs this can change by way of the the backstage virtualities changing now there is then the general body without organs which is also has another name the plane of imminence and this is simply where all virtualities are held um there's no real language which can really articulate the way you know they're not there's not some creature there holding them that's simply where they are and also um it's not actually a plane because the philosophy of eminence would deny a plane. This is actually what Michel says. Criticisms of Deleuze and Guattari is like if you're admitting to a plane, then you're already admitting to different levels. Um, I think there's just a potential misunderstanding, but they were good friends, so potentially says right. I'd probably lean that way. Um, but that is all the body without organs is in its most basic. Um, and yeah, I mean, that is that relatively clear? Uh, I guess I'm not sure. Like, it, so, uh, I, it, it, uh, it, it kind of makes me think of like just like a version of like a sort of like Platonic idea or like a like a like forms. Like, could you relate it to to that or like? Um, in terms of Deleuze and Guattari, I would say that they're coming at this uh, more of a Kantian way in which the form if I just try back you have the intuition of the object you have the concept of the object which together allow you to have intuition but the form the, the problem with the form is the form is the thing before you intuit something which allows it to have its inherent structure so virtuality is a free flowing so you unless there is a conceptualization of a form which is constantly free flowing the, the 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 beauty of virtualities is that they are um smooth they're slippery they are they 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 don't yeah they 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 are interruptions they're undifferentiated whereas when something becomes actual, it's become completely differentiated from everything which it is in relation to. Virtuals, virtualities, and therefore the body without organs as a collection of virtuality, is the body without organs which then allows the uh, continual potential or possibility of something to alter in our relations to it. Um, I'm sorry, I just have a quick, quick, uh, quick question. So yep. would would the uh, would a example of a body without organs be say a rock removed of its uh, rockness, allowing all possibility for quote unquote it to sort of elaborate? Yeah, I mean, if the the the, the body without organs of a of a rock would be hardness, um, stoneness, grayness. These are like transferable attributes which aren't part of its actual self once these have been captured in its actual you could say well it's like x gray you know it's a very specific gray it's a very specific hardness and that's its actuality the the other things are it's virtuality it's potential i mean of course there's there's going to be limitations on what they can change but it what's interesting about them is in relation to things such as institutions and things such as humans um but a rock still would have a body without organs Okay. Thank you, that makes sense. So is any attribute possible to be an element of the body without organs? Like even something that like heat, which could obviously change something else, like that that would sort of be a a machine in a way or 
make it into a machine that would be able to interact with other things? Or is it just so virtual at the point when it's a body without organs that you just don't think about it in that way? Well, I guess maybe to, I mean, I'm running this metaphor through in real time, so to speak. But if you took the, the metaphor of a house as something which had this body without organs, it would actually, it would have for certain people, the body without organs would retain a virtuality of homeliness. But if you were to set fire to that house, while it was on fire, heat would enter into the body without organs as this, that whether or not it's a positive or negative potential isn't because we're com coming at this primarily from an inhuman point of view that's still a potential everything has would the house would have this potentiality and possibility to become to become on fire so the virtuality would would be of um fireness or or temperature or something along those lines but in the same time the virtuality of homeliness would have an alteration in relation to those people who understood the body without organs in that way so I think what you're saying with the questionnaire is like in terms of it being fixed there would there are of course virtualities as being undifferentiated and free flowing would inherently alter we can't really say it has a structure but the 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 assemblage of virtualities which make up anything if a certain virtuality enters like the house being on fire whatever we could name that virtuality it all would alter the alteration of the virtualities which become actual would alter the the actual so it's like the virtualities are almost prior but they are i wouldn't want to say that because you can't have one without the other so it's it's like is it both like the attributes such as like the houses say like yellowness and also its possibilities like the possibility to be on fire yeah yeah it's it's uh yellowness is different to yellow yellow is a phenomenal reality and a material reality yellowness is a form of uh, I don't want to get too heavy on the language here but let's just for ease of it just say conceptual understanding so there is an inherent difference between them so yellowness and the potentiality for something to come on fire should we just call that virtuality fireness they would retain in the same place because they're just the the virtual attributes which make that thing, that object. But uh, I, I would I would like that that it is not only uh, it, a house can not only be on fire or yellow, but it could also be a boat in another life, so to speak. It is it is not simply it is it is far wider than uh, than I think I think. Uh, You've made it seem. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I was going to get into that when we get to the idea of a uh, ah. uh, neurotic machine. Um, so the idea of this is something I spoke with about Charlie Johns. That interview is actually probably fairly helpful for this. Is that, like Forster's just said, there is this potential there to become a house could become a boat or um, uh, a oh, brilliant. Really? Oh uh, well, it, the, the, there is the virtual potential there uh, another great example is from the novel the broom of the system where they give he, he, though he's not targeting this towards Deleuze it's actually a Wittgensteinian um, anecdote where Wittgenstein's on about someone asks him the function of a broom and he says well the function of a broom is dependent on whether or not you want to sweep the floor or break a window and that's actually a very interesting argument with regards to virtuality because in terms of the context of what you want to use that object for the virtuality immediately changes because you suddenly the virtuality becomes this well it has a potential as um a window smasher virtuality and you use the other end of the broom now what this has in terms of the parano uh, sorry the neurotic machine is in terms of Deleuze and Guattari this inherent criticism that they're having of psychoanalytical institutions and major institutions and things which are constraining us by this idea of like the negative you know we'll the negative is like stop there you know we'll box this in is that we do the same thing with objects we do this we do the same thing with virtual potentialities of objects and for them the means of emancipatory politics with regards to what the human can be i would argue begins with the virtual understanding of things 
because if you're beginning with the actual you're beginning with an already pre-striated and pre-confined ideology say you know ideology has this actualization in reality as let's say the labor party or the conservative party and there's something prior to that which is more important with regards to um what sort of happens with someone which is sort of why i think for many people who study deleuze and guattari the contemporary contemporary identity politics in terms of those people who criticize a temporary contemporary identity politics saying oh you've been so inspired by the post-structuralists well i don't think so because i think that all this fragmentation of and multitudes of different labels whatever they may be are actualizations and they're just boxing themselves off again and they're actually boxing themselves into even tighter and tighter corners but really if you want to sort of liberate yourself and emancipate yourself you almost need to stay on the level of virtual possibility without ever um adhering to an actual because as soon as you become actual as soon as something becomes actual you have suffocated that virtual possibility into an actualization and that is now stuck on the inside and this is what happens with objects you know um people are very funny about sort of using certain things for other things like i don't know um using a spoon instead of a fork or something and then people are so neurotic that they've limited the potentiality for their existence due to certain societal cycle uh, psychic um and authoritative and society as i've already said society sorry constraints put on them which are in themselves these sort of virtual things that come in constrain you and you're stuck with them um yeah uh i i you 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 were talking about the body without oh f first of all uh the thing about being in the virtual and not actualizing it is very again i i need to bring up the taoism where there is a great emphasis on doing without doing which is very very similar to uh, uh to this uh to this process of becoming uh which which you're referring to uh but the other thing is that when you are describing the body without organs and and this process I, 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 I would advise everyone to uh, get into it, not metaphysics first, but get into the metaphysics through uh, the practice or the use of these concepts. Because I think if you, if you learn about these, these, um, <laughs> this yellowness in such an abstract way, you might not understand why we need this concept of a body without organs. Uh, to uh, uh, and and I would I would I would if if someone asked me to describe what a body without organs is, I would describe it, uh, yeah, as uh, as 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 uh, something, which uh, in which every possibility is still open, uh, which which is basically what uh, made Meta Meta said, but. I think it is much more important to focus on the use of the concept rather than the metaphysics of it uh, at first. In in what you you're it's kind of good that someone else is in here that because I clearly have this bias towards the metaphysics. In what sense then do you see it as in and in what way can it be something which has uh, been used? This this is Again, I am jumping ahead a lot with this, but uh, the body without organs, uh, you, uh, you can think of it in, in, in this way. So, oh, I'm sorry, there's a car. <laughs> uh, so, you have, let, let's say that you are in a bar drinking with your friends. And while you are drinking, you are you spot a beautiful woman or man or whatever that you want to chat up. Now, if you are, uh, uh, to, to first, when you come into the bar, you sit down with your friends and then you become, uh, you become alert to all these beautiful women. In that sense, to go to that alert phase, uh, you need to first transist through uh, a phase where your other feelings and and things, uh, for example, going down the street, making making small talk with your friends, these are transformed 
this attention is transformed into being on the lookout for these beautiful women or men. Uh, now, the body without organs is basically the transitory state between these actualized states of uh, being on the lookout for women. And when you approach the woman, you need to go from being on the lookout, you know, peering from the corner as a, as a hunter, you go to a more active state where you chat up, you are charismatic, and uh, these are totally different qualities. So in a sense, I would, uh, uh, the body without organs is the, the uh, through which you can attain other forms or other states of minds. Minds. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, it is the open potential itself. So, is it just the way that there's continuity between becomings? I guess, or like different states uh, of being for a particular what, thing. Well, well, what Meta earlier said that if you completely uh, liquidate yourself into the body without organs, you are not coming back. There is no longer you. Uh, you 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 have lost the woods. You have you are lost in the woods. There is no you anymore. But uh, in a sense, yes, it is it is uh, uh, moving towards the body without organs and then taking a sharp turn to another place. Uh, so in a sense, yes, you are correct. But it is it is uh, never if you go if you never go full body without organs. You know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well. well Sorry, I just have a question about that. When you you said the body without organs, are you talking about the this sort of general plane of imminence body without organs, like, or are you talking about the body without organs, maybe like within yourself? Or uh, see, yeah, when when uh, when what that that is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the metaphysical part is that uh, it. I in I I I I am actually not hundred percent sure what meta means. What by the general body? Yeah, yeah. it is. Uh, it is. Uh, the general I, I'll, body without I'll, organs is the plane of imminence which holds all yeah. virtualities. And yeah, but I do make a clear split between the two. Uh, this. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, in 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 that sense, it is well. My, 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 my instant answer would be both. It is just moving towards the state. It is a liquidation inside yourself. Uh, so uh, uh, both is my answer. <laughs> this is, this is why sense. I, it is, it is uh, you know, it is a more of a, uh, a principle that, uh, that well, you, you use, uh, a concept that you use than, uh, uh, than a reality. Uh, reality. Of course, it is. It is real. It is part of these processes everywhere, but it is a concept first and foremost. I just jump in there with this idea of which one are you you um, going from? All singular body without organs of singular objects or singular people are um, in communication with the general body without organs because when and this is this is when it gets really complicated new new things when you because you, you think well if they're all there then how are new ones made when new virtualities and possibilities are are let's just for now say created they would enter into this general body without organs so this is where just every bit of potentiality is held so in terms of you know when you say well if you went too far into the body without organs which one are you dealing with well you would of course always retain your own body without organs because you're always going to be uh let's say an extension in space as a body uh, an actual an, an actual body you know a human being that we look at and we can sense and touch there's going to be a body without organs for that thing but whatever's going on with that you know so a great way to think about it is most let's say most people they have uh, their body without organs has a boxed off section you know this is very very simplistic and Deleuze and Qatari wouldn't do it like this but body with a boxed off section of virtualities with regards to their sexuality with regards to their family with regards to their political beliefs with regards to their ethical beliefs and these would be sort of like a collections of virtualities which then build up their body without organs now the idea of sort of you know as force said going for a walk and getting lost in the woods is you have just fragmented these and they just aren't even there you've pushed all of them to the limit and you're just following virtualities and you you're you know you've just completely lost yourself and this is why 
Deleuze and Qatari sort of stress retain some territory. And this can sort of be, you know, retrain, retain a sort of coherence of body without organs. Because if you don't, if you become fully schizophrenic, then you end up just sort of being pulled to and fro by the whims of whatever virtualities are being uh, slid around in that society at the time. Uh, I, 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 I also, uh, <laughs> sorry to take over a bit meta, Slim Boy Fat asked how are virtualities different from potentialities? Uh, this, is, this is precisely, I am, I am sitting in a forest right now and uh, uh, I see a tree and in another, in another you know, world or a, a potential present, uh, it, is a, it is a house. It has been made into planks and it is a house. Uh, now, if I, there, is, there is literally no physical possibility that it is a house in like the next two seconds. It is, it is simply impossible, but virtually, so it, there is no potential for it to be a house in the next two seconds, but virtually this possibility exists in it all the time. So uh, virtual, uh, this, this, is a, this, is, this is a bit of a, you know, a hack, but the virtual, uh, virtual is uh, it, the, even those possibilities or potentialities that seem impossible logistically right now. If that makes sense. Um, I was just thinking, like before, when you were talking Faust um, about like the practicality of, or like a more practical view of the body without organs. Like uh, you made me think of the concept from uh, complex systems theory of uh, the face space. So like the face, like the space of possible states that a system can enter. So like for for, for like a horse, you have the face, maybe like the states of like a gallop or a canter or like a horse walk, whatever. And like for water, you have the faces of uh, like running water, uh, water, uh, liquid water and uh, uh, like ice and that like gas. So like, is this sort of like gearbox or like possible like modes? Like, is this like the, the body water organs or like how does that relate to... <laughs> The body without organs. See, well, I I I, I would say that uh, uh, well here here we 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 are we are diverging quite a bit from the text, but I think this is inevitable. See, all of what you described are the habits of a horse. These are all things that are in the horse's muscle memory. Uh, things it can access those without you know much effort. Uh, these are uh, uh, instinct is not the right word, there, or maybe it was instinct. Yeah, it is instinct, not intuition. Uh, no. It is instinct. It is a horse's instinct to you know go into these gallops and such. But the so it does not need to you know go through the body without organs to access those things. Uh, but for example, mm, if if a horse if a horse were to give an, uh, machine, uh, a prosthetic leg, then learning to use that prosthetic egg would involve, uh, a transformation inside the horse. The horse would need to learn to use that leg in that sense. Then all these gallops and walks and those things, those need to be accessed through the body without organs going towards, and then, ah, I found the right, correct, uh, usable configuration of this uh, prosthetic leg, and then come back into a new normality, if if that makes sense. Because, so the body without organs is basically whatever the opposite of your normal everyday habits is. It is the breaking of those habits, in a sense. Yeah, I in mean, terms of bring, oh, sorry, go ahead. In terms of bringing Deleuze into engagement with these sort of mathematical concepts, there's like a book by a dude called Manuel Delanda that specifically goes through and maps a lot of Deleuze's ideas onto complexity theory, and another one by like Simon Duffy that sort of really gets into it. sort of like he's sort of interested in that sort of thing. That whole connection has been like explored in a lot of detail by some pretty smart and knowledgeable people. Like for me to try and do it off the top of my head here, I don't think I'd do it really do it any justice. I don't know if anyone else has more of a background in that sort of thing, but that's sort of really an interesting direction that you can sort of take Deleuze because these guys 
make their own interpretive moves in that process, like there's been some arguments for and against like Delanda's interpretation and all you know, its supposed scientific nature and all of this kind of stuff. I actually kind of like quite a bit of his stuff, but I guess that's just me. I don't know what everyone else thinks about him. Yeah, Deland Deland is great, but like you say, um, I'm a big fan of um, uh, thousand years, ten thousand years, a thousand years of nonlinear history. Um, that's my favorite Delander. But but like you say, Delander's extremely. You know, there's only so many people who could explain Delander, and Delander himself is is almost as 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 complicated as Deleuze Guattari at times. Um, to to drag it back to the body without organs, there is a really, um. There's a great quote within with within what Forst was saying about the difference between the actual and the virtual habits of someone. The virtual habits are these sort of points where it breaks. And there's a brilliant little quote where Deleuze and Qatari state, the desiring machines attempt to break into the body without organs and the body without organs repels them since it experiences them as an overall persecution apparatus. And because they are differentiated, this this when they head into the body where the organs their persecution is that they wish to differentiate this 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 fluid and this is uncomputable you can't be extremely free flowing but at the same time still adhere to let's say an ideology or a familiar thing you can't just head back into that so the like force said the the, the, the in terms of what's retained in the body without organs of the person is the point of its of its limit and the point where it could fragment. So I I actually I actually have a question. Uh, there towards the end of our uh, reading, uh, there the, or it was actually at the very end. It was discussing how uh, how the Nietzschean subject lives through all of Nietzsche uh in in a single day uh can you i was i was a bit i was a bit uh, you know stonewalled by that i have i have some ideas but i'd love to hear what everyone has uh, thought of that passage so the passage in question um goes it is not a matter of identifying with various historical personages but rather identifying the names of history with zones of intensity on the body without organs. And each time Nietzsche as subject exclaims, they're me, so it's me. No one has ever been as deeply involved in history as the schizo or dealt with it in this way. He consumes all of universal history in one fell swoop. We began by defining him as Homo Natura and lo and behold, he's turned out to be Homo Historia. This long road that leads from one, uh, from the one to the other stretches from Holderlin to Nietzsche. And the pace becomes faster and faster. The euphoria could not be prolonged in Nietzsche for as long as uh, for as long a time as the contemplative alienation of Holden. The vision of the world granted to Nietzsche does not inaugurate a more or less regular succession of landscapes or still lifes extending over a period of forty years or so. It is rather a parody of the process of recollection of an event. Um, in terms of um, the the the. There's sort of a, a mirroring with regards to what Foucault is doing there. So this idea of the alteration from Homo Natura to Homo Historia, this idea of the suffix there, Natura or Historia, becoming the very fabric of that being. So this happens in Foucault where he mentions in Birth of Biopolitics about the sort of installation of the idea of Homo Criminalis into society. And the idea of, you know, this idea of a criminal human and the language, the the Latin, homo criminalis, unlike English, where you would say that person is a criminal as if there's a division, homo criminalis implies that people can literally be criminals. And then that further implies that there is either criminals or non-criminals. You'd no longer have this distinction. And Foucault doesn't actually stick around with Homo Criminalis too long in that book. He then uses that to theorize of this idea of uh, Homo Economicus, which is an economizing being. We are entirely economizing. And I would sort of, I don't know the lineage here, and it's very difficult to say with regards to Foucault, Deleuze, Serre, Guattari, because they're all working amongst each other. And these books often take years and years to write, so you don't know what's coming from where. I mean, they're probably working at it together, but Homo Natura is 
the would be the idea that man is is inherently has this relationship with nature and it's sort of part of him and homo historia would mean um i think within anti-oedipus would mean like a neurotic attachment to history to the point where we we have this neurotic reliance on history and we virtually constrain what it can be and what it can mean to us and we become beings of history in the sense of this sort of chronology of locked in actuals as opposed to beings which are to use some very very cliche words in touch with our potentials and our potential virtuals um so in terms of like the whole idea of um living history in one fell swoop would be the idea that well overarchingly the idea of history the body without organs of history has already constrained itself you're already abiding by a neurotic attachment to this ideal that is history which itself quite openly says about these uh shall we say a successive series of of locked in actuals you know you have let's say rome and historically this is locked in this has already been actualized the virtuals we, via, we... via the, our understanding of what is history these virtuals have been locked in yeah we we have this uh, stereotypical image of rome is is that what you're trying to say yeah yeah ex- exactly that and and but but our history generally is the mode of analyzing time in that way is something which is locking in in the 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 virtualities of time as possibilities are being locked in by the mode and method of history whereas like i've used this <laughs> examples like literally thousands of times now but michel says example of time where if you were to draw time as a linear succession or a grid with dates you know equidistant apart on a handkerchief and crumple it up dates in time would meet which never would chronologically but behind these times in time are virtualities of that time and then they meet mm. in time and these virtualities would pass between so the idea you know as soon as you're adhering to the chronological method methodology of stereotypical history in which all these actualities like i've read that book on history right those that's what happened those actualities are locked in well you zoom out a bit and history is one and the same thing so in terms of living it in one fell swoop it doesn't matter what you live because all these actualities are already locked in and the the, the the one fell swoop is simply a death of potential a death of retrieving potential from various moments in uh what we consider to be history unlocking so so this is this is basically uh i so, sorry for the name drop but this, so this is basically him uh, uh using analyzing history via proust uh Sorry to say, it's one of my uh, complete empty spots. So I, I, I. Oh, you haven't read Proust? I think Proust is uh, is is the author that unlocked the loose for me. I think that might be why why we why we think so differently about it. So, um, to to maybe uh, I have I have a personal anecdote that maybe maybe could clear this up. I I was walking, I was walking at a dark night towards my home. And I was wearing a leather jacket, and I got an overwhelming sense of connection to a past point of time where I was a completely different person, but I was still standing somewhere, wearing a leather jacket, going towards home. It is uh, uh, basically so. It is. It is uh, 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 taking taking these uh, these uh, points in time, and then connecting them in a non-linear fashion and uh, that's that's what proust uh, proust is about uh, proust is about uh, uh, taking taking time and then uh, uh, utilizing um, utilizing uh, time as a medium uh, through which characters uh, change now this <laughs> this sounds like every author ever but uh, in a sense it also takes time uh, uh backwards in a sense it 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 uh, takes these connections 
backwards, you know, these subjectivities which reach out into the past and find the, their brothers and sisters uh, in, in, in these other moments. So when you are talking about history, uh, you know, acting out uh, all of history in one day, it is maybe, maybe a similar, you know, I take all of history and then I acted out, and now this moment is a brother or sister to the rest of history. It is the same thing uh, in a different uh, form. It is, it is the same thing in a different expression. Is this what the passage is, is talking about? The same thing in a different expression. That's at least how I'd read it. I'm always going to be very reluctant to say this is what this passage means, or this, this oh, yeah. especially, or especially with Deleuze. I mean, I imagine the my the Nietzsche as subject I would understand it as the the that they are drawing on uh, the uh, amor fati of Nietzsche Nietzsche's theorizations the idea that um, that one should proclaim that if a demon turned up and and this is Nietzsche's idea if a demon I think is it a demon or a daemon I think it's a demon doesn't matter um, turns up and says you know, you you are, you are now condemned to live this same life over and over and over again. One should live in such a way that they, you know, they would fall to their knees and rejoice. That's how you should live. Um, in terms of this idea as Nietzsche as subject and the fact that they're on about all of history in one fell swoop, it seems to, you know, especially that Deleuze mentions uh, is working with Nietzsche in difference and repetition it seems to me that he's trying to move away from the idea of the eternal return of the same and he's trying to state that there that within virtual potentiality is the potential to move away from the return of the same and move towards difference because neurotically when you adhere to oedipal institutions you are adhering to the same Whereas when you begin to unlock and fall into the body without organs, you're unlocking and and communing with potential difference. Uh, mind if I jump in here for a minute? Sure. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at least of where I'm reading that whole idea from Nietzsche came, there's, there's an excellent lecture by Deleuze on Spinoza where he talks about affectivity and with regards to his theory of representation. But I think with that line to the idea of the schizo in history, you see this, you'll see this uh, throughout the book, how the schizophrenic is in contact with all of history and he lives time in this insane manner. I think, and I think the key to this is that it's fundamentally having to do with his idea of affectivity that essentially this the schizophrenic uh judges its uh, states of history by saying i'm feeling like this i'm feeling i'm feeling i'm becoming this so i, I, I like judge schraber says i'm feeling a becoming woman or something and he feels the affectivity of that metastable state of becoming woman they use the term metastable from gilbert simondon but uh it's meant to refer to this idea that it's an for, for the schizophrenic there's an endless almost nomadic becoming and the fact is that they're identifying with figures of history, right? In that sense that essentially they're identifying with the affect of that figure of history. So, uh, yeah, that, that's actually, that, that makes, makes a lot of sense. The, Yeah, I mean, Bill, do you do you want to expand a bit more on the 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 link with Spinoza and 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 um, affect there? Because it's you know it's everyone's going to have their um, expertise here, and and you know this is certainly a weak spot for me. So if you wouldn't mind expanding on that, that would be great. I mean, okay, so I think that the key thing with the conjunct so what we're discussing here essentially is the conjunctive synthesis of cons consummation which is the final state in, in terms of the syllogisms it's the final stage of uh, um, of subjectivity for them and uh, with regards to that later on in the book we're going to find that there are two forms of subjectivity right there's almost if you, if you want to be reductionist about it there's a nomadic state where the schizo is in and there's uh, there there's there's another state which is where the paranoiac is in 
And so with, with regards to the schizo subjectivity, uh, what's happening is there, so there's a bunch of intensities that, 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 that have been, you know, on the body without organs almost. And so it's, they get in the third synthesis, they're in this state where they're consuming these intensities and, uh, an intensity is essentially just, it's, uh, like, uh, uh, races or forms of intensities, um, groups or forms of intensities they're essentially these things that have been uh recorded onto uh the body without organs with regards to whether the uses of the last two synthesis and them and and even perhaps later on the modes of social production in a certain locale and so what's going to happen for the schizo is that he's going to be consummating everything in this endless process of becoming i think the key word here really is that the schizo is is becoming in this sense and I, th I think the thing is that the schizo lives almost in this way that's completely non-representational. So the schizo, um, the sch in the sense, if the schizo is non-representational, it doesn't care about things like the order of words or the name, right? It doesn't, it doesn't identify with any names. It just identifies with everything, right? The problem with Freud when he was diagnosing Judge Traber was that Judge Traber was everywhere. Judge Traber was a woman, or Judge Traber was said he was a Negro or something like that. And it was, it was, it was basically driving Freud a bit. It was getting, it was pissing off Freud, and that's why they also say the schizophrenic pisses off the psychoanalyst. But uh, what happens then is that the schizophrenic identifies with pure affectivity, right? He identifies with the feeling of something rather than the identity of something. And it goes back to this whole theory of non-representationality, right? So if the schizophrenic it can sense that it's, that they're, um, I, I think they identify with the woman in the sense that they're feeling like they're becoming women or something like that. They feel the intensity of the woman. And that's, that, that's, and that's with regards to the affectivity that, and it's it's not very close to Spinoza actually. They they Deleuze changes it a lot from Spinoza. I just posted in a lecture of a, a of Deleuze talking about Spinoza, and I think that's where he goes over some of this. And do you think that has a clear connection with the idea of virtuality in the body body without organs? Then this idea of in, uh, intensity and non representational. Do you think that the non the 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 what isn't representation of which they're adhering to as a schizophrenic is um the the virtualities um, with i think with regard to virtualities is that so i think with the key with anti-oedipus they tell us very clearly that the body without organs is produced in the third in the, in the as the third object right when uh there's a break in the flow. And so this, the identity gets recorded. So for example, they first give us the example of the schizophrenic table. And essentially, if we didn't have a body without organs, the schizo would never reach the process of creating a table. They'd just be produ producing something of some sort of, uh, you know, they'd just, it'd just be process grafted onto process, onto process, onto process without reaching anywhere. And finally, when the table is produced, it, it need, there needs to be a disjunction between two machines and you get a recording of a sign off the table and uh so there are two uses of the disjunctive synthesis right there's the sense that you can have it with regards to the virtual you can have um uh, if, if the synthesis is done correctly right you can have the possibilities multiply and you have all these potentials now on the body without organs and the schizo can then identify with it so with regards to the virtual i think it's the sense that the schizo has more possibilities on the virtual uh rather than the paranoiac right the paranoiac is restricted or even, and the neurotic is restricted to just one, uh, to consume, consummate one intensity, right? That's what they talk about in the nuclear family later on. Uh, oh, did you want to say something? Uh, no, no, go ahead. I was just going to say that essentially it's, it's nomadic and the schizo is able to be nomadic since it has a greater amount of virtual possibilities, right? I uh, the, also I something something that I think uh, it's very easy to misunderstand with Deleuze is that Deleuze is not uh, advocating for uh, some sort of pathological mental illness. Uh, uh, for for example, when uh, Guthari uh, had his uh, clinic, uh, there still were patients who were schizophrenics who uh, clearly. Uh, needed uh, needed uh, guidance in in how to in how to function and Deleuze definitely does not not want us uh, you know to become pathological in our societies. 
uh, it is it is important to to when we when we skate the schizo we in some sort in in some sense need to think of it uh, only as a mode of thinking not that is not the same as the illness as it manifests in in people uh, it is it is uh, I think I think Meta made made a comment earlier about uh, uh, about schizophrenics. Uh, in particular, and and we must uh, we must be very careful to not equate uh, the schizophrenic as a clinical entity to the schizo as a mode of thinking. Yeah, I think you're spot on there because I think earlier on in chapter one they say pretty explicitly that you know that the, the schizos that you see in mental institutions and stuff, th those are not the schizos that they're referring to when they're talking about this uh, creative process of production. Uh, yeah, it, it, they, it's going to be discussed much more heavily later on, so <laughs> I'm not going to spoil the book. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, yeah, someone stated there, so does uh, Ruben says, does the Deleuzean schizo mean being free from dogma and letting identity shift? To a certain degree, it seems so, you know, as a nomadic being, it means that you, you can be free from dogma or free from certain... Um, Con con containments or repressions to a certain extent but of course you have to, you'd have to analyze in the Deleuzean uh, Deleuze Quartarian sense that if there's an implication of dogma then there's an implication of something which is also correct you'd also as a schizo have to push the limit of that as well so it's not like there's for this you know there's just this one realm of these institutions are bad because they're big and authoritative it's actually a critique of of the entire notion of authority itself, not just the institutions. Uh, I I I I I'd like to chip in. I think here, uh, Deleuze has actually provided you with an exact answer to that question. Uh, it is it is not uh, it is not uh, precisely a rejection of all dogma, but it is a rejection of the dogmatic image of thought in uh, difference and repetition which basically means that the schizo has no preconception of what forms of thinking and theorizing are permissible and which are not. So the schizo is entirely free, free, free to think whatever he wants and whatever he finds uh, the, uh, the, the best version to handle this situation. So uh, the, it is it is it is not a matter of rejecting all dogmatism it is a matter of uh, you know handling dogmatism with care you know you can become you can you can utilize a dogmatic framework as a schizo uh, to get what you want um, I, yeah, I, I mean, can't think go ahead I mean, later on, when we get to edipalization, one thing that's going to occur is that they're going to t say how much the Freud hates the schizophrenic, right? I mean, even like schizophrenia from almost before this book was written, I, I feel like psychoanalysis, when they looked at schizophrenia, it seems like such a good thing for psychoanalysts, right? They can see, oh, there's so much delirium, there's so much vi imagery, we could analyze all of this. But it turns out the schizophrenic is actually, it's, it, it, Freud hates the schizophrenic, right? They they, in this book, they say that the, the schizophrenic is the only person who can say, oh, Oedipus never heard of him, right? Schizophrenic is the only person who, who's, who's, who's away from being Oedipalized and exists outside all possible symbolic orders, right? So the, the, th the thing that we need to keep in mind here is that essentially the, the schizophrenic doesn't care, really, at the end of the day. It has, all these, it has all these potentials to refer to and to refer off itself. It, it doesn't mind it, it can it's basically some sort of radical freedom I think that's the best way to put it just radical freedom uh, and uh, I, I I would like to point out that in the text it is even it is even said that the schizo can admit can freely admit that it is an Oedipalite subject just so it would be left alone uh, it so it is it is uh, it is free to you know symbolically repress itself but because of how it operates, it the oppression, you know, it falls away like uh, like foam. <laughs> I actually um, like the Taoist connection here too, again, because you have, um, I think, mainly in Zhuangzi, that that's another like the other big Taoist 
who's, who's always talking about be, becoming some some shitty piece of wood and and the the worst wood in the in the forest because then suddenly people won't, won't cut off the tree and won't use you in into the symbolic order and won't, won't trap you into there because because yeah they think well that that wood is useless um and sort of so also second thing to to go further on the Taoist connection is that i um, I think there is also where the sort of the ethics and the metaphysics um, come together very nice because, of course, Taoism talks about this completely inhuman process that's just happening and you can't do anything with it about it, even if you try that, which is the Tao, you can't really name it. but And that sort of has this sort of Lenian acceleration thing. Um, and for me... Like Lania is sort of a Dao- cyber Taoism because it's still because at the same time they're talking about ways to um, to decondition yourself and to unlearn the sort of the the what it, it's probably for them it was different sort of Oedipus that sort of keeps you trapped instead of going with the process. So it's it's there's like these both these things. It's about and. I think this also very much works in a Deleuzean epistemology because his epistemology is not about just simply looking at this metaphysical process, but you have to get into it to also get it. You have to sort of work with it to get into becoming with it because otherwise you're not going to yeah, get it. You're, you're not going to... You, you can't you can't be a spectator coming looking at it from the side because you'll you'll miss the whole process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, <laughs> it's good to see that there's someone else who <laughs> who who has read the lose uh, in a similar way with me. Uh, I, I and uh, to to add that there was a very real Oedipus in the Taoist time. It was uh, the Confuci- uh, Confucianism, which which basically is very similar to Oedipus. It is uh, putting family above everything else, being subservient, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is uh, another really really easy uh, easy par- parallel with uh, with the loose there. I do think that uh, their metaphysics. Uh, go apart, you know, there is the, the central process at the core of both of them, but after that they kind of uh, separate a lot and you can't do a one-on-one reading, but they are definitely very useful to each other. I have a question I wanted to ask. Uh, I'm sorry if this was discussed earlier. I joined 40 minutes late because I thought the discussion was starting an hour after it actually did from the pinned message. But this is the first time I've ever read any of the Luz and I was kind of confused and was wondering if I can get more clarification on the things such as the uh the mirac oh sorry one second. The miraculating machine and the paranoic machine. I know that they're described as forces of repulsion and attraction, but I was kind of confused, like on page 11, when they're talking about Judge Schreber, that his organs are miraculated and demiraculated by the paranoic machine. And I was kind of confused on what that meant for organs to be miraculated or demiraculated. So, I think for... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, so uh, I think for first, uh, the, the, the thing that's happening is that uh, at the very beginning of their ontology, right, we have breaks and flows, right? And these flow breaks, the concept of flows actually comes funny enough from Keynesian economics, but the, the, the flow break part is is interesting in this regard because a flow can be anything, right? You can have a flow of traffic, you can have a flow of shit, you can have a flow of, uh, of milk. And what's happening with these flows is that their uh, desire is coupling these flows together, and by coupling these flows together, it's essentially producing things. So the schizophrenic table is coupled by a couple flows of energy, for example, and desire comes in to start producing it. The key thing is that essentially, uh, without the, the, the when this in or, 
in the process of pure production, the schizophrenic table never has an identity of a table, right? It's just the constant process of grafting on. And you never actually get to that aspect of a table. And so the only, eventually the desiring machines need to break apart to, to reach that identity of a table. Otherwise, you'll just be stuck in this endless loop of production. So when they break apart, a sign connection of those desiring machines gets recorded on the body without organs. And the body without organs can the, the work of the body without organs is to either say yes to these sign connections or basically say no to them, right? So when it says yes to them and it tracks off them, it creates this list of disjunctions with all the sign connections and it multiplies their possibilities. When it says no to those connections, it essentially repulses them outside. So there's an element of the signs being connected to the body without organs and there's an element of the signs being thrown away almost anytime the signs are thrown away you get less potentials and anytime you, they get thrown onto it you get more potentials right so the miraculating machine is when you have more of those potentials and the paranoiac machine is when you have less okay that makes sense thank you so we've got um 25 minutes left um apologies about the the timing of the um in the pinned tweet, I think I put, yeah, GMT, and I realized that should be BST, because we're in British summertime. Ah, okay. So that is my bad. Very sorry about that. But there, this is being recorded, and it will be on um, YouTube, so we you know, gotcha. can go through it. Um, but I'll change that for, for next week. Uh, but yeah, we have 20, 25, 20 minutes left. If there's anyone there who's lurking, or anyone here who has a clear question about this section that they want to get in while we're talking about it, um, yeah, you know, go ahead. Don't wanna, don't, I want to make sure no one's sort of missed just to ask a very basic question here. Technology for becoming. Sorry, just I'll go first real quick. Just a very basic question: Are Deleuze and Guattari uh, targeting this book in particular towards our present time, as in capitalist sort of modern societies, or are they targeting this against all human societies in general? That is uh, one hell of a question. Um, <laughs> whether or not they're they seem to have stripped back enough that I think I'm not sure they're targeting it at societies in general but the the way, you know, back to that question which Foucault states in the start is like how would the masses, how do the masses come to repress themselves, it's like they're targeting it at the functions and actualizations within our reality which make it possible for that to happen, whether or not that's a society or whether or not that's contemporary, um, doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, I think, you know, we've mentioned him a lot, but the Landian alterations do lean heavily on capitalism, but you'd still have the function of the desiring machine and the, the, the idea of production and consumption within other ideologies. So I think perhaps... At the same time, I think Foucault is working with Bertha Biotop politics, which is working specifically with capitalism. I think it's sort of working with that underneath because at the time we're beginning to see, this is late 70s, I believe, we're beginning to see the the birth of sort of, you know, um, hyper-capitalism, you know, when it really un unclicked and started to go mad. And I think it's just potentially a coincidence i'm i'm not sure maybe someone else has got some more anecdotal information on that but it seems to me that they're addressing in sort of typical continental continental fashion first if you have a definition of how do we um what is it to be anti oedipal then their point would be what are the let's assess the structures first which allow both Oedipus and the possibility to be against Oedipus, what are they before we go into definitions? So you start with almost the reality before you go into the definitions. Because if you start from the definitions, then you don't, like if you start from Oedipus, you'd already be stuck in Oedipus. So they're sort of taking a step back. That's how I see it. So they're, yeah, they're coming at it from that angle, which is why I think it's so, such a fragmented text. I have a question again about the body without organs. Uh, like, how does a body without organs become produced? Like, uh, they say, um, here's just a little quote 
capital, which they're saying is a body without organs, thus becomes a very mystic being, since all of labor's social productive forces appear to be due to capital rather than labor as such, and seem to issue from the womb of capital itself. Which kind of makes sense if capital is a body without organs, but in what way does it come to be that? And in what way does it come to sort of underlie the ability of, of labor to be productive? In terms of how does uh, how do the, the virtualities of a body without organs sort of become real and become actual is what what Deleuze and Quattari call overcoded. So something an idea becomes so striated that it becomes real and then is repelled from I it's important to think of the body without organs and virtualities as undifferentiated and actualities as differentiated. Something becomes so overcoded and striated that it becomes very clear cut and very different from undifferentiation and at that point it becomes this reality. With regards to to capital, um, there's some really interesting things going on with capital's body without organs. But in, uh, sorry, what was your question with regards to capital labour? Yeah, and what like it? They say that uh, it seems capital becomes seems to become the thing out of which all the productive pe- potential of labor comes. And I'm just wondering how that sort of inversion of reality can happen, and and it, what relation that has to a body without organs. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, is that the quote, a quote about capital is so so close that it almost seems as if the acts of man are actually miraculated by capital as a, as a, as opposed to there being a division between man and capital uh sort of i guess it's a quote of, from somebody else but it's on page uh, 11 of the text you linked in the, in the chat right it's just uh it's saying that the productive powers and the social relations of labor in the direct labor process seem transferred from labor to capital like i i guess because it became so striated and different just from the natural production or whatever of of labor in itself outside of the system of capital or i don't really know how labor has it has an identity without capital existing but maybe i'm just playing into the well, narrative to a certain extent Deleuze and Guattari are moving from a that they, they are somewhat influenced by marx in this and marx has this idea of like an alien power which overtakes man and and, and turns him into this capitalist being and i think the alteration for Deleuze and Guattari is that is an alteration with that alien power whereas within marx you can still retain this division which is where the emancipation would be you can remove the means of production from the alien power itself and like break yourself away and there's a possibility of a division from from the alien power which causes um this capital mode of of production with deleuze and guattari i don't think the division is so apparent i think that because of the utilization of the philosophy of virtuality the two things are actually very in, entwined because virtuality is a free floating so the 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 virtualities which are within the capitalist mode of production which say it's let's say the right or good mode of production they can just as easily make their way into the body without organs of a human and in that sense the human man becomes possessed by the, by the system of capital and begins to work in that mode of being you find many people you know who who are sort of targeted their actual lives at being profitable beings and um in terms of the you know the division changes in terms of the body without organs that would be the place which retains the free floating possibility between both the, the method of production of the capitalist mode of production and man being sort of possessed by it um yeah that's sort of what i'd have to i'm not sure if anyone else would have anything else to say on that one yeah i mean what's what's essentially happening here is the is the black humor of the miraculating machine right and essentially that uh at the you know the the body with that organs is very much created by sign connections right and it's uh it, it, it's from that first process of desiring production that it gets created for, from sign connections. But it appears to be the source of everything when it, miraculation occurs in the body without organs, right? That you have, all these, you have all these potentials on the body without organs, and they all cling so tightly that essentially it seems that everything comes out of them. I, I, think, one exa- I think their example with capital is, is pretty uh, – if you look at it realistically, I mean, what is capital at the end of the day? It doesn't, it doesn't produce anything, right? 
uh, it, it, it's, uh, but it's, it conditions the realm of capitalist production. I'm just going to read what I just put in here. <laughs> Over time, capital becomes more and more infused into the spheres of production, right? For instance, it confuses the spaces of home and work. It conditions our identity through consumer purchases. It monetizes social media and so on and so on. And production under capitalism has an incredible power to subordinate all kinds of production to the body of capital. It does this not only through the commodification of goods, but also in part by altering the perception of that commodification and is as, as a natural part of its own production. And essentially, it, you know, that's it becomes the divine source of everything. Yeah, this is exactly what I meant when we earlier on when we were first talking about the body without organs, and I said, you know, you have the singular body without organs, you have the general body without organs, and you have this other conception of the body without organs because the body without organs of capital and capitalism, and this is something that Land does hone in on, but it's definitely in anti Oedipus. The body without organs of of capital is inherently malicious in the way that it forms capital. And the, the 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 reason that I think capitalism is so important in this book, and perhaps uh, someone asked earlier, I think it was James Knight asked earlier, are they specifically targeting this at capitalism? The specifics of capitalism as a system is that it can adhere to undifferentiation, right? So what do I mean by that is that if you look at systems such as monarchism or feudalism, these are striated, they have clear rules, they have clear points where you can say, right, that's no longer monarchism. Capitalism, on the other hand, has a teleology, but it doesn't have many rules. It has Its teleology is growth for itself. So this allows it to continuously grow itself and be continuously hypocritical. And it feeds off paradox and hypocrisy. And anything can happen within capital. And it can use the general body without organs and all undifferentiated beings and still not change because in itself it never changes all it needs to do is target itself towards um further production for itself further growth of itself and th you know in this way it builds on about it alters the perception that commodification commodification is naturally part of production and um you know it confuses the spaces of home and work these i read as sort of possessions from the body without organs of capital possessing man and, and altering his relationship with his own um body without organs in which he believes that these are the correct ways to to be and this is sort of where schizophrenia helps is that it will break out of this i had another question about near the end of our reading sort of three questions connected together but i was kind of confused on how the celibate machine produces intensive qualities from the opposition between the miraculated and paranoic machines. How do intensive quantities come out from that opposition? And also, what does it mean when that the results of this opposition are an unlimited number of stationary metastable states, which an object passes through? I wanted some clarification on what that exactly meant. And about the... Nietzschean subject and how when they can identify the names of history within these intensive states saying that was um, that every name in history is I I was just really confused on that whole section um regarding the last one we we did spoke about the uh, the, the Nietzsche section earlier with regards to the every name in history is I is this idea of assuming subsuming the methodology of history as we understand each and every event in history as this sort of actualized finished product not subsuming the events into us but but understanding that as the only methodology of understanding time so each and every um uh, is it i each and every history is an i god it's been going on um the your inherent relationship with yourself and with regards to possibilities in terms of time changes when you begin to striate history into what we commonly known as like history books and events of history um with could you just expand on the, the celibate machine question again it's quite a complex one yeah yeah so i was con i was wondering on how exactly the intensive quant in intensive quantities how exactly do they come from the opposition of the forces of repulsion and attraction of the paranoic and miraculous machine miraculated 
So int- intensities of re- repulsion come from the paranoic machine and the neurotic machine. Oh, I thought maybe I misread it that the celibate machine makes intensive states from the opposition of the forces of attraction and repulsion. I mean, or am I, I reading that wrong? No, I think uh, so. Uh, I I think out of the three syntheses, actually, uh, the third one is the hardest. So it, it's 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 uh, it's a little bit complex. But what's happening here is that essentially you have a. So, um, so far what we have with the, at least from, let's take chapter one and chapter, I mean, and chapter, section one and section two. And so far what they've told us is that, uh, there's two laws with the body with the organs, right? It, it, it either attracts production and gives you more po- uh, potentials or it, it uh, repulses, it repulses these connections and it gives you, it gives you less, it gives you less, uh, possibilities or potentials of movement, right? That's one of the two movements of the body without organs. And it's a certain ambivalence to it, right? That it cannot, that it can help you at the same, it can give you more freedom at the same time, and it can restrict you at the frame, same time. And now with the, with desiring production happening almost on the other side of the body without organs, and the body without organs always coming into these forms of desiring production and always intercepting them, and taking some parts of it and then throwing away some parts in that whole, in this almost sign connections that are being formed on it. I, I think what you need to understand is that um, there's no, by what they mean by that there's a conflict, they're not saying it's dialectical, right? One of the big things that Deleuze tried to avoid was the whole idea of the negation in Hegel. And that was, that was all done in difference in repetition. So what they say is that um, these, these for, these, the form of attraction and repulsion they basically need to come to a conclusion, right? And so what they do is the conclusion that they almost come to is a series of intensive states. So what are intensive states? Uh, races are intensive states. Uh, groups are intensive states. Um, any sort of identity is an intensive state, right? The concept of uh, man, woman, or all these global objects that they later call them in the next chapter are intensive states that are produced. And so these are produced based on what, what sort of connections you have at your body without organs at a specific point of time. And, but the, the key thing here, what they're describing is the nomadism of the schizo. And so the schizo, I think what they, they use a, a very sp- special word that comes from Gilbert Simondon and that's metastable states. And that's, that was actually done in Deleuze's logic of sense. And essentially the whole idea of metastable states is that when Simondon describes the process of crystallization, he's describing uh, the individual from the, from the form of individuation itself. And so the individual is conceived as this constant process of becoming, a becoming that never ceases to be. And that's what metastability is almost in this case. It's the fact that uh, the schizo is passing through history and it's consuming all these intensive states and the intensive states are felt as something. So he's feeling that he's becoming God. For example, that's another intensive state of identity that's there on the BWO, and the way the way they consumes it is just by pure affectivity. Sorry, what was the last word of that statement? By pure what? Affectivity. The the, the, the affectivity. I mean, it's just that idea of feeling something, right? That intense feeling. Okay. What? Why the name of celibate? I have, I don't know, but I mean, I've actually heard the name celibate used before. I'm pretty sure this is not it. This is incorrect because I'm pretty sure it has to do with uh, sexuality in terms of Deleuze and Gatsuri. But I've heard the word celibate used in some cybernetics theory before. I mean, with regards to celibate and, and with regards to someone being celibate in terms of the forces of. A- attraction and repulsion building intensities within them it would understand that someone didn't have you know so didn't have um a libidinal fixation you know with regards to the libido which is uh jean-francois leotard's libidinal economy is being written roughly around the same time and this idea of the, the you know what drives the forces of the economy in terms of in a very human way is libidinal forces you know, sexual forces, but put very roughly. Um, so a celibate machine would be this rare thing which is then born in terms of its libidinal intensity from looking at these. You know, I 
don't know that passage too well, but I'd be interested to, to sort of talk about whether or not something could remain celibate within um, this Deleuze Quatarian way of being, because as soon as there's a form of intensity and a direction towards some form of libidinal and intensity, then what, you know, is there a possibility to remain steady state? I don't think so. Um, so yeah, we've got um, five minutes here. Um, so not really enough time for any question on Deleuze Guattari, but if anyone has got any uh, small, or just a question they want to ask before the end here, or you know, maybe even some feedback or something like that, then um, feel free, feel free. Uh, I, I have a question. Is, uh, is the Friday day like completely locked? Because uh, I, I assume that many people are coming from work and therefore are unable to attend because of uh, the time frame. Uh, you mean you'd, would you like to, what would you like to do on on a weekend? Oh no! Uh, like I, I personally don't care because uh, I, 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 I am pretty much free. But for example, my brother could not attend because you know he was at work because he has regular work hours. Uh, just something, just something to think about.